It isn't how hard we train. It's how well we rest. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, we speak to an internationally recognized clinical pharmacist and board certified clinical nutritionist who specializes in uncovering the underlying metabolic issues that are keeping you from being healthy. He has more than 30 years of experience helping people to create a perfect plan of action for improving their overall health for a complete lifestyle transformation. How does your gut affect your mental health? Why do sex hormones become more important as you age? Want to know the real reason why you're having trouble sleeping? Well, our guest today is about to reveal how you can feel better, improve your performance, and achieve optimum vitality. So please welcome the founder and president of The Metabolic Code, Mr. Jim Lavelle, to the Escape Your Limits podcast. You know, when I, um, I was competing and I was going through pharmacy school, I lost my scholarship. I had, a, I had a neck injury, so I couldn't go on to play football in college. So I went from being this all-star athlete to collapsing a disc, losing the scholarship. So I, I, you know, I got pretty down, right? And I found bodybuilding and found powerlifting and, and really trained hard, qualified for the US Nationals, but I still wasn't feeling well. I wasn't healthy. Uh, I went to someone that uh, put me on that path and I want to tell this story because I think it, it sums up exactly what you said about escaping your limits. So here I was like working on my health. I was behind the counter of a pharmacy in the roughest neighborhood in Cincinnati. Because back then I was 265 pounds, one big knot, you know, just <laughs> qualified for the USA, the North Coast USA. And they said, we'll put Laval in the toughest neighborhoods. Nobody's going to rob him, right? And uh, so one night, a lady came up to me. She handed me a, 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 a prescription for a diabetes med. And she went off to do her shopping. We were in a farm, a Kroger, Kroger store. So it was, it was a pharmacy and a grocery store. She comes back. And I looked in her grocery cart. And every food she picked was going to make her diabetes worse. And I did what I wasn't supposed to do. It was like five till nine. And we're putting the boards up to the windows anyway. I said, hey, can I take you around and show you a couple things? And I just give you a couple suggestions. Cause all I could think about was my grandma. My grandma was beautiful, but you know, you know, blind, you know, amputated fingers. I mean, it really made an impression on me. Mm. And uh, I took her around and this is in the roughest neighborhood, lowest income neighborhood. The next two weeks, other people were showing up for the grocery store with from the, from the nice pharmacy, uh, pharmacist, right? And, and so I thought, wow, if people of every income are interested in their health, why can't we educate more people? Went to the Kroger's, uh, 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 Kro actually I went to their president and I said, I wanna tag foods in every Kroger store to show diabetic friendly and heart health friendly foods. And I wanna write a book with the Jewish Hospital Cholesterol Center, healthy shopping at Kroger's. And he looked at me and he said, you gotta remember this is 1980s, right? He said, son, are you crazy? I'm not about to tell people what, what to eat or how to eat. He goes, I'm a grocery store, I, 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 we sell everything. <laughs> Long story short, I go to my marketing director, uh, my pharmacist marketing director. I said, I want to do events. I want to tag foods. I want to test cholesterol and blood sugars at a pharmacy and the grocery store. And I want to make a wow event out of it. And uh, we found more diabetics. We did more, you know, finding of hyperlipids in people. We taught people about eating well. And we actually developed the first FDA approved food tagging system that went into Kroger's and impacted 2.7 million lives a week. Wow. So here's the deal. Here's the deal, right? This is my close because you asked you ask my you asked my story. Why do I do what I do? It it's kind of when I thought about it, all you gotta do is reach out and touch one person. So I touched a person that was on a Medicaid card in the most indigent part of the area late at night. And it developed into a program that ushered in millions of impressions of information about people's health. So if we can just think about helping one person, mm. it can change millions of lives. And so that's what I think is unachievable. We always think it's unachievable to get to millions of lives, but we affected 250,000 people at Lifetime Fitness with our programs, 93% compliance. So I think we better escape our limits and we should reach for the stars and try to help and serve as many people as we can. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. 
Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. So, Jim, thank you so much for inviting me over to your... Is this a surgery or an office? What are you uh, It's just an office. It's our center. It's, yeah, it's our... You call it a clinic. I like, I, I like to call it our, you know, it's Laval Metabolic Center. So it's where people that are well come and sometimes people that are in trouble come. Right. Okay. So I, I was, when I started looking at you, we mentioned this off camera, I, I, I realized how much, you, how many books, what is it, 22 books you've written? Right. <laughs> so did, do you just got a lot of time on your hands? Or yeah. You just break? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Ask my wife. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a sickness or a passion, but I think honestly... Uh, I got into this work, you know, really wanting to help people. And for me, communicating with people, whether it's through media or through writing, I mean, you got to, you got to get the information out. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I, I don't think I have a lot of time on my hands though. So. Yeah. Do you, do you, with your books, do you, and I, I've not gone into all of them and today we were going to talk about cracking the Met metabolic code, which I'm sure is a fantastic book for anyone to read, but do you, do you generally sort of, are, are they all, kind of are they interlinked in any way um, or are they sort of just just different parts of things that you're particularly interested in sometimes they're just a, a you know an area that I'm interested in like uh, I wrote a book called green immunity a few years back just to give people some general ideas of what to do about your immune system but in general I, I always come from the perspective of how does this affect your body mm. So whether I'm writing about drug-induced nutrient depletion, so people are on medications. And when you're on medications, it can deplete certain nutrients. What's that mean to you? Uh, so I'm always trying to look for themes that kind of bring you back to understanding how does your body function? Because I, I think a lot of people are, are kind of mushy on that. You know, they go to their doc, they get a lab test, and the lab test says, hey, you're okay. Everything's fine. And what it really means is you don't have a disease yet. And it doesn't mean, well, how well are you? You know, how good are you functioning right now? And so that's what I tend to focus all my writing on because it's all about, you know, people deserve vitality at every stage in life. I mean, that's what I've run all my clinics by. All of my, I guess my ethos is that whether you're an eight-year-old or an 80-year-old, you should be able to feel the best you can. Mm. So that's why I write what I write. So with your type of philosophy, I suppose, is, is what you do typical? Because I, I guess, you, you know, in most cases, people go to the doctor when, as you say, when there's something wrong with them. Um, do, do, is that when you sort of get involved with people as well? You know, they come to you when there's something wrong or do you tend to sort of try and wind back the clock and say, well, look, okay, let's, let's start a bit before then and try and avoid you even getting to that stage? Well, it's, it's both. Right. I mean, I, I work with athletes in all five major league sports to have them at optimal performance. And then I have people that are in trouble. So people with autoimmune disorders or people that are going through oncology or people that have metabolic syndrome or, or they have diabetes and they're not feeling that great. And they're going through their traditional care, but they want to add more to, to what they're doing. They want to try to reverse either some of the damage or to feel better and then in many cases, because I'm the academic co-chair at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, so I sit over 24,000 docs and we teach a lot about, well, how do you really try to keep people's metabolisms driving them towards being well as they're aging? I'm 60 years old. So at 60, that's different than when I was 40. And so the things I even do when I train, the way I eat, what I need to look at in my labs, I have to pay a different attention and maybe have different outcomes and lifestyle choices because of my age. Mm. And I think a lot of times we don't think of it that way. On the fitness side, you may have a young fitness trainer, for example, that grabs a 50-year-old and it's like, hey, we're going to do this high-intensity workout. And it's not getting that understanding of, well, where is that person at in their continuum of health? And so that's what I do with people is I... I basically evaluate them and look at where their metabolic roadblocks are and then try to develop a plan that's unique to them based on their lab markers, their biometrics, how they're feeling, 
surveys on what they're feeling, and then organize that into a plan of attack, and then measure results, because I'm all about results. Right. So in, in your book, you, you mentioned this metabolic syndrome, um, and you reference metaflammation as well. What is... What, what, what is your, how do you define your metabolism what's, and what's metabolic syndrome? So, you know, metabolism, this is a great question because I get this asked so often because people get confused. They go, isn't your metabolism how many calories you're burning? And don't you lose weight by eating less calories and training more? Mm -hmm. How many times have you talked to people that went down to almost eating nothing and no weight came off, even when they were training? Mm -hmm. So your metabolism, it's true that it, the, the, the strict definition is, you know, you know, calories burn. But really, I'd like people to think about your metabolism as the sum total of all the metabolic reactions going in your body right now that creates your health today and is really pointing you in the direction of where you're going to end up in the future. So you're not just a liver. You're not just kidneys. You're not just a brain. Your body's working as a complete metabolic system signaling and telling your body what to do. And it's either giving good information or bad information. And so for me, uh, understanding the disruptors to your metabolism, are you under stress? What's your sleep like? What's your diet like? Have you been exposed to things? What kind of illnesses have you had in the past? What kind of medications have you been on? Everything pushes you from the time you're in your mother's womb to where we're sitting right now creates who we are. So let's try to unwind that where we need to. And so that's metabolism. Right. So, so it's, it's kind of, it's everything that's going, it's not just what you're eating. It's like all, all the different parts within your body then. Huh? You, could, you could think you're eating great. You, and, and I mean, I have people come in all the time. I say, so you know, tell me about your diet. Oh, I eat great. <laughs> really? What's great mean? Right? Uh, because for one, there is no one diet that works for everyone. If you're an APOE, you know, three, four gene SNP, you got to keep your saturated fat down or you got a higher risk of Alzheimer's. So there's variances in diet. Can we yeah. agree that there's vegetables for everyone? Yeah, vegetables are good. I mean, I had a guy on the phone the other day, literally, it was yesterday. He said, well, I don't do vegetables. You don't do vegetables? <laughs> I mean, okay. Uh, but we're going to have to change that because you're coming to me to say, how can I be healthy, right? So how do we get you to move off of that stance? Uh, and so what happens when people uh, end up in this situation where their chemistry is starting to go awry, right? Their metabolism is moving in the wrong direction. There's this new term uh, called metaflammation or metabolic inflammation. So whether it's due to all those things I stated, you could have a bug, it could be stress, it could be training too hard, right? Overtraining syndrome. Uh, it could be not enough fluids. It could be uh, any number of things, wrong nutrition, right? But what happens is, is your body is supposed to reset from an inflammatory event, right? It right. repairs. And so when you don't repair... Or say you keep loading exercises hard day after hard day and you're continually pushing that inflammation button and you never get it a chance to reset. What happens is you get into a chronic state of metabolic inflammation. That starts to alter how you absorb your iron and, and uh, actually store it as ferritin, which can lead to feeling fatigue. It can start to create things like insulin resistance where you start to gain weight around your midsection. You start to get sluggish. Your mitochondria don't make energy. You can start to feel sluggish in the head, short-term memory, start to lose bone. You can start to feel anxious. And all of this is because we haven't paid attention to repair. And I know, I mean, I can see how fit you are. It isn't how, it isn't how hard we train. It's how well we rest. Right. You know, it's all about the recovery to really get the gains on the effort we put in the gym. I mean, I've trained a fair amount in my life, and I know that that's really important. So one of the areas that really gets out of line, big problem for America is metabolic syndrome. Right. And metabolic syndrome is pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension. So I'm on my way to being a diabetic, I'm on my way to heart disease, and I'm obese. So... This is a striking amount of people. So when you think of this, 50% of the U.S. population has either prediabetes or diabetes. 50. Wow. Five zero. 38% are insulin resistant and 12% have type 2 diabetes. 
50% of the adult population over the age of 50 have heart disease and 33% of the adult population over the, uh, the age of 18. And, and now you know why I write as much as I do, because I, I lived around people with diabetes. My grandmother was a fingerless, toeless, blind diabetic. Mm. My father is diabetic. And, and we get caught not understanding that by not moving, by not learning how to make better food choices, that all of a sudden we find ourselves 30 pounds overweight and our doctor's telling us we're diabetic. And then the consequences get big. And that's metabolic syndrome. Right, okay. Early in your book, you talk about something called the, end, end, is it endo, endo, endoctrine, endo, I need to say end, endoctrine, Endocrine system. Is oh, that? the endocrine system. End, endocrine system. Yeah, yes. you talk about that and, and also the hormones. And that was one of the things that, you know, that sort of struck me um, in terms of what, what's going on there. And I, I sure. wondered whether you could kind of explain it, even to me, in sort of very simple terms in terms of the indo- endocrine system and, and also the, you know, the, the link to, to hormones as, as, as well in that. Because that, that Oh, was, sure. Sure. So, I mean, once again, you know, first of all, we hear about sex hormones, right? Mm -hmm. Well, sex hormones turn out they do a lot more than just, you know, make us ready to go, right? So there's testosterone and estrogen and progesterone, all really important. We're finding out that testosterone is important for men as they age because men go through andropause and when testosterones get low, oh my gosh, it increases our risk of heart disease. We get mentally flat. As men, we kind of get the whatever syndrome, you know, like, oh, whatever. I don't feel like doing anything, right? right? That kind of stuff. Uh, and then for women, obviously, when their hormones start to shift, they also have a variety of problems from hot flashes to other complaints to mood changes. But the reality is this, is that even these, even our endocrine system works in this unified theory. They're all communicating together. So for example, your, your brain has something called the HPA axis, so hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis. So when you get under stress, you get under fight or flight, your brain takes on this signal and goes, oh my gosh, we got a we got, we got fight or flight response here. Somebody can send too many emails to me, right? It's not a real white tiger coming, but something happened. And so the big issue is, is that I start to get under sustained stress, and then I start to make more cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And as that cortisol goes up, it starts to branch out and have effects. So so when you have chronic issues with elevated cortisol, I'm under sustained stress for a long period of time. Maybe I'm working long hours. Maybe I'm in a relationship, you know, maybe a family member, a death in the family, something changed. And when you start to release all that cortisol over time, you start to do what's called flatten the cortisol curve. Your cortisol is supposed to go up high in the morning and drop in the afternoon, drop more at bedtime. And that's when you release your melatonin, go into a restful sleep, and you rejuvenate your brain for the next day. That's what's supposed to happen. That's a normal kind of curve. Normal thing. Stress hormones in the day, sleep hormones at night, repair. It also kind of matches how you should eat too, right? Right. It's like the sort of thing of security and eating is important. But when cortisol goes up and is sustained over time, it inhibits the release of something called gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now, what that means is I'm not making my testosterone if I'm a guy. Really? So, and for women, it alters my sex hormones. So what starts to happen is chronic stress starts to affect. And how many times have you heard this? People that are under stress, their sex drive's low. <laughs> Well, of course it's low because it's a physical thing that's going on. It also inhibits growth hormone release. Mm. So you don't repair and stay as lean. So now I'm a man. I've lost my testosterone. That means I'm going to start gaining weight. I lost my growth hormone. I'm not going to repair. And then cortisol also makes your insulin receptors not work as well. And when that happens... Your blood sugar goes up and you store more fat. <laughs> the next thing that happens is all this is happening at one time. And this is what's going on with a lot of people. And then with cortisol, you make more adrenaline, right? If I right. scared you, you would make a lot of adrenaline. Right. And of course, when you make adrenaline, your blood vessels get stiff. So now my blood sugars are going up. I'm gaining weight. My blood pressure is going up. I start to lose one of the biggest things I find in a lot of athletes. I have a lot of athletes come to me with trouble with stress fractures. And their stress fractures are because they're, they're overtrained. They're making too many stress hormones. And that means your bone has to release minerals from the bone to balance the pH 
mm-hmm. of your of your tissues. Right. And so it's a global effect. So your endocrine system is operating to give you energy, burn fuel, make you feel like you're relevant and potent in the world, right? You want to be the young lion, not the old lion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's also intimately involved in repair of your tissues. So when these things start to get skewed in their relationships and you start to see changes in your testosterone and changes in your um, sex hormones uh, and changes in your stress hormones, maybe you're, get, you're not sleeping well now because yeah. you're pumping out too many stress hormones, right? All of those things are melting together on people. And I'm not a big advocate for people just getting, you know, oh, just go get hormones. No. Because if it's, if it's stress that's the problem, and sleep problems, like if you have apnea and that's causing you to lower your testosterone, well, fix the apnea. You know, there's cause and consequence, right? Don't put a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. Right. Figure out, you know, how to correct things. So, so the so putting in extra important. testosterone isn't going to solve the problem. You, you, you need to go to the cause of what is reducing that. That was the whole purpose of the Metabolic Code book was right. get to the cause, cause and consequence. Now, if you're a 58-year-old male and your testosterone is really low and there's no other things that are there and you're at heightened risk of heart disease and you know, your doctor thinks you, sh- you should be on something, well, okay, that makes sense. The, th- the thing I'm seeing is that a lot of people are reaching for it. And I, because I teach a lot of doctors who learn about hormone replacement therapy at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, it isn't like this thing where everybody just goes, oh my God, I can't believe how well, well I feel. And I believe that's because if you don't clean up the underlying problems, you can't allow for that you know, therapy to kind of do the best that it can do. Right. So it sounds like stress, which causes raised cortisol, is, is, has a huge amount of impact. And I suppose that do you, at the moment in what's going on in the world, I suppose people are probably you know, losing their jobs or pressure, locked in, there's, there's a high amount of stress. Is that something that's going to contribute to the breakdown of, of you know, healthy, you know, a healthy environment, would you say? Well, you, you know, you've heard about the quarantine 15, right? No. Well, that's a term, that's a term that's out there in the media, the quarantine 15. So when you talk to people, and I do, because I have people coming in here, mm-hmm. and I do a lot of Zoom now, I'm doing a lot of telehealth visits with people, And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm having happy hour, virtual happy hours. We're baking more, right? So what happens when people get under stress is they need a reward, right? You eat to help comfort you. It's like, oh, if I could just put that cookie right here. I'm going to rub that cookie on my head. I already ate four of them. I'm feeling kind of full. Maybe I can crunch it right here, man. This is going to feel good, right? And But but the reality is, is, is that people do end up feeling more anxious. It's incredibly relevant. I mean, more people are having trouble with sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, people have gained weight. They're not as mm-hmm. able to be as active. And their reward cascade is triggered, meaning they need satiety and they need comfort food. So sweet, salty, crunchy. Uh, so, you know, when I always explain to people and I always get people to their mouth to water, I'll go, hey, how about if we brought in some crispy chocolate covered bacon drizzled with a little caramel and then put molded sea salt on top of it. I wonder if you'd want a piece of that. And you know, most of the time people are like, well, yeah, who wouldn't, mm-hmm. right? Because it's almost like we under even understand the term sweet and salty and what it does to our brain. Mm. We start to almost feel that texture and go, wow, that's, that's, that's good eating right there, right? Especially mm. when you're under stress. Mm. So what are you, with, with there being stress and, and I guess... I, I, I suppose then stress was originally, or, the, or that 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 sort of reaction in your body was probably caused, you know, years ago. I suppose when you when you had real danger, and and I suppose your it was preparing your body to 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 get away from it. Essentially, is that yeah. is that how it, how it happened? But nowadays we 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 sort of create this sort of an imitation of stress, whether it's like you said a an email or a disagreement or something, and, right. and your your body still thinks there's, there's the same danger. That's right. But instead of it just being for a short time, it's, it's continuing, you know, day after day, week after week, for example. And, and that is what's creating a lot of the issues nowadays. Yeah, I mean, the, the papers are out on it are pretty clear. They, they call it all, allostatic load. So if, if somebody in, you know, that's watching would want to understand it, you can look at allostasis 
and allostatic load. Allostasis is the ability of your brain and your body to take on either mechanical, physical, or psychogenic stress, right? Either it's psychological, it's physical, or it's some kind of mechanical stress, right? Um, or, or an accident, right? Um, and then allostatic load is when you keep having all those pressures on you mm. and your brain changes the way it signals. You can almost think of it like a, a circuit breaker box at your house that all of a sudden some circuit breakers blew and you know what? You can go in the house and you can turn that light on all you want. It's not going anywhere until you correct that circuit breaker. Mm. And that's what happens with your nervous system. And so it's a, it's a unified way of thinking about it. So allostatic load is when you finally break and things change. Now I'm gaining weight. I feel sluggish. I'm tired. I don't sleep well. I'm anxious. Uh, maybe I'm not thinking as clearly. Uh, it's all those things start to cascade as we get under sustained load. Mm. And, uh, you know, look, I, I, you know, fight or flight, really helpful in crisis, learning how to work through stress. It's probably one of the biggest things I try to work with people on. Really? Yeah, I'm always, uh, stress is, all, is almost always a component of what we talk about, um, whether they're in for whatever, whether it's performance or whether it's because they're battling something. Can you, can you measure stress like through, through measuring cortisol in your system or something like that? Yeah, I measure cortisol. You do. Uh, yeah. I, use a, I, I do it two ways. One, I do serum, so just right out it with blood. And then I also do either salivary or urinary cortisol, but I'll measure it during the day so that people can, we can see whether there's a diurnal pattern to your cortisol or not. Are you making, first of all, are you making too much? Right. Are you not making enough? And then are you following that pattern of rising appropriately in the morning, dropping appropriately at noon, dropping again in the mid-afternoon, and then hopefully cascading downward at night? Because the consequences are big. When your cortisol is too high at night and you release something called corticotropin releasing hormone, that blocks you from going into deep sleep. Right. So your brain can't rest. And it also resets your insulin receptors, your beta cell production of insulin for the next day. So it kind of starts to, when you get out of that circadian, circadian mm -hmm. rhythm, man, everything starts to get sideways in terms of you trying to take control of your metabolism, take control of your health, and take control of the way you feel. Right. So what about, what, say if you have something like um, caffeine later in the day or alcohol, does that mess up this cortisol and, and the, 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 the sort of rhythms that you're talking about as you're well. You're trying to get me in trouble here, aren't you? You're, you're, really, you're, you're pushing me, me I'm trying to... <laughs> I got you, I got you. So I'll tell you what, I think um, it depends on your genetics on caffeine. Some people get by fine with caffeine a little later in the day. Other people uh, don't do well at all if they take in caffeine anytime after 12 noon. Um, alcohol is interesting. Um, I always talk to people when they're wearing a whoop or an aura ring or a whoop band. I always mm -hmm. like to ask them about, well, what happened the night you had a couple drinks late at night? What did your REM sleep look like? What did your deep sleep look like? Mm -hmm. How many hours sleep did you get? Did you feel rested when you woke up in the morning? And, you know, look, just being objective in general, when people eat too late or they drink too much, they're going to mess up their sleep. Yeah. And some people, it's more drastic, where they could maybe only drink even one drink after 8 p.m. and notice that their, their REM sleep and their deep sleep is disturbed. Mm -hmm. So I like it when people use wearable data uh, and actually make it productive, because a lot of times for the, for the longest time, if you remember when wearables first came out, everybody's like, hey, this is great. Uh, what do I do with this information? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, now mm -hmm. we're understanding that there's these relationships I could give you an adaptogen in the evening, or I could give you something that would calm your nervous system down in the evening, maybe a natural compound uh, like theanine, and it could drastically shift your ability to have more deep sleep. Right. So it's this, you know, so, you know, yeah, alcohol, the kind of food you eat late at night, take it in caffeine, all those things could shape those nighttime hours and your ability to recover and repair. Right, right. And, and with, um, with this, cortisol because I was sort of listening to you on a on another interview you know it also talks about the stress as it relates to building muscle so um that you know you you can be working out and think you've got the exercise component sorted out but if you're stressed then you know you're not going to be able to build muscle and repair is that is that correct as well 
Yeah, you know, one of the key things, so if you look at uh, one of the big things in literature, it's cortisol to testosterone ratios, right? right? So the higher my stress hormones and the lower my testosterone goes, the more catabolic I get. And so I can tell you right now, I have people where I have them cut their volume down. Obviously, if they're with a, you know, if they're with a team and do it through their trainer, but I'll recommend, hey, cut, cut your volume down by 20% and all of a sudden they start to grow. And you've seen this over the years. You, you know this is a fact, right? So many times people end up overtraining, triggering more cortisol. And you have to remember when you trigger cortisol over time, your gut gets more permeable. You don't absorb nutrients as well. Mm. You create more inflammatory compounds. And so, you know, when you're, when you're doing that and you're training, you know, you're actually either you're going nowhere or you're actually breaking down your muscle. Right. So it's really important to understand. I, I always like people varying their workouts. You know, I've been around enough strength coaches and have taught different strength coaches over the years that it's, you know, varying workouts are important. People need rest cycles. Right. And, they, and they're, you know, people need times where they get after it hard and people need times where they're resting and people need that intermediate workout where maybe they're focusing on flexibility or hypertrophy or whatever it is. Mm. But I, I think it's really important that we, it even goes to people that are going and doing, say, spinning at a very high rate. I mean, I had a 61-year-old ex-CEO uh, came in to me. She super focused, just exited her company. So she's going to Orange Theory. Not, and nothing against Orange Theory. I like, I'm, it's good. But I'm just saying, the 61-year-old, she's going to Orange Theory once or twice a day. And so she's getting day. her heart rate up <laughs> to 200. And at her age, there's no way she should be doing that. And she was coming into me. Um, because she was anxious and couldn't sleep. Well, you're, you're running from a white tiger and you're not resetting. And when you don't reset your nervous system, it's going to stay in heightened fight or flight. And that's why we see people with heart rate variability issues, right? They don't have good pliability to that heart rate. And it's because they get a sustained fight or flight response. And now all of a sudden, my baseline heart rate's higher than it should be. My heart rate recovery isn't so good. I notice my blood pressure really isn't as optimal as it could be. And those are key signs, especially when I see it in a fit person, mm. that you're probably working out too hard. Right. How do you, as a, without going to a doctor, is there, is there a way that you can, um, you can see whether your cortisol is too high or you're too stressed? Is there... Like, can you get it from sort of like a whoop and or or anything like that in, in, a, in another way of another type of measure? Another way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, look, getting cortisol is pretty easy. You could get it. But I always would say I would look at blood pressure and heart rate. Your resting heart rate should be below 62. Your one minute recovery and two minute recovery should drop basically 12 beats per minute. Uh, if you wake up in the morning and your resting heart rate is 10% above your average resting heart rate, and you trained really hard the day before, you probably need a day off. Mm -hmm. uh, and you should look at whether your blood pressure drops in the evening, right? Because if your stress hormones are supposed to be high in the morning, you do your blood pressure. And at night, they're supposed to, you're supposed to drop your stress hormones. And that means, well, likewise, the adrenaline goes down. Well, then your blood pressure should probably be calming down towards the end of the day. So that'd be called a dipper or a non-dipper. Right. And so that's another way that you could infer your, your how is my nervous system doing? Am I stuck in sympathetic overdrive, which would definitely infer that you're probably pushing out too much cortisol. And you know what? Let's ask some simple questions. Do you feel overcommitted? Are you anxious or nervous during the course of the day? Do you feel like you're pushing a thought through jello sometimes? Do you have trouble getting asleep or staying asleep? What's your craving patterns like? Do you do well or sometimes you're not even hungry until you get home at 4 or 5 p.m. and then you just start eating and you can't stop? Or you have an insatiable craving uh, for comfort food like I talked about before? If those things have happened and you're losing lean mass and putting weight around your belly, you got to look at your stress hormones. It's super important because it has downstream effects on everything mm -hmm. else going on in your body. So where do you start with that then? It's, it's obviously you wouldn't necessarily treat that with, with a medicine. Is that, is that more to do with just recovery and your mindset and mood? And is, is that what helps to manage that level of stress? Because it seems as though a lot of this, a lot of these issues that seem to originate from that. 
Yeah, it's a great question. I'm a believer that you should take supplementation and do mindset because I have a lot of people that over the years, and I mean, I've seen a lot of people over the years, as old as I am. Um, <laughs> so uh, people try really hard to do mindset, and yet it's not enough to neutralize kind of the programming, that circuit breaker. Mm-hmm. Now, in some people, it does. They do meditation, or they say they do uh, box breathing, for example. I mean, think how important this is today for breathing. I have to have a watch tell me when it's time to breathe. <laughs> Right? Isn't that crazy when you think about it? It's time to breathe. It's like, oh, wow, I haven't been breathing. Mm. So it's important for people to learn these kind of tools. I'm always teaching people on box breathing. I actually have a device that I I hook up and do heart rate variability. I do a customized uh, bubble ball that they, they breathe on based on their nervous system. And I can show them how close they are through this device, um, how close they are to burnout. Right. And so... If you're going to do things to intervene on your own, first of all, you got to get realistic about your schedule. You got to look at what in your life is the the big roadblocks, right? What are the big roadblocks? How can I control those or can I not? I mean, sometimes you can't. You might have to work two jobs, Mm. right? Um, But techniques are important. Drinking water, not as much caffeine. Don't have your fourth monster of the day, (laughs) right? I mean, don't over-caffeinate. That's going to help your nervous system. And then I have go-tos. Like I I like to have people try, um, take some melatonin at bedtime, help reset your circadian rhythm. Is that, can you, is that, can, if you have it, like I've done, I used to travel back and forth to Europe regularly and I took melatonin. Sure. Is that, can you, can that be bad if you do it for a long time or is it a fairly safe, um, whatever? You know, there's a lot of what I'd say bro science saying that, oh my gosh, you can't take melatonin for a long time. I've, I mean, I've been doing this work, giving melatonin to people for 37 years mm. and I haven't seen any adverse events from it. Um, however, the way I work with using melatonin is I'll use it to reset someone's circadian rhythm. Like I'll reset their night sleep pattern. Mm-hmm. And then I'm also giving them something during the day, whether it's an adaptogen, something like, you know, an adaptogen is an herb that helps your body cope with allostatic load or with stress. So you heard of ginseng Mm -hmm. or schizandra or rhodiola is a big popular one in fitness circles. So it helps your body to maintain a normal nervous system under a higher metabolic load. Mm -hmm. Now, if it gets past that, I need to use things that, oh, you're anxious or you're craving. Then there's herbs that I would use or nutrients like theanine or relora that you could take that would help your body to say you're working two jobs and it's going to be a stressful day or you're in a bad relationship or what, whatever the reason. Maybe you're successful, but you're working 16 hour days to keep that success rolling. So you got to look at your body in a 24 hour clock. So if I'm having trouble sleeping at night, dampen my stress during the day and then take a little something at night. But as I teach people how to gain control of their stress and their sleep, Hey, if you don't need that melatonin, take it away. Mm. You don't need it. You're sleeping well. Now you're doing deep breathing. You've compartmentalized your stress. You're doing better in your relationships. You know, you, 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 you took care of the problem. And so now you don't need it. And then for using herbs like theanine or relora, are you having a stressful week this week? Do you know you're going into a storm? Well, yeah, take something to help you manage that storm. You know, it's interesting. Since the beginning of recorded medicine, the most valuable herb in every culture, I don't care what culture you go to, were herbs that help people cope with stress. (laughs) I, doesn't that blow your mind? <laughs> Think about that. I mean, since the beginning of recorded medicine, we've identified that stress is the thing that's most valuable for us to take control of. Unfortunately, mm. what's happened in our culture here in the U.S., we wait till people break. Mm. And I'm not. I'm not creating it. Look, I taught at medical school and pharmacy school 17 years. I get. I love working with doctors. This isn't a criticism, but the reality is. We wait until people break and they end up having to go on an anti-anxiety drug mm-hmm. or they got to go on an antidepressant. Right. There's, it's like, well, you're not quite broke yet. 
So I want people to be on the front side of that and learn how to manage your stress and use nutrients and herbs to keep them optimized so they can deal with that stress load while it's there. And then hopefully along that road, they're learning how to manage their stress mm. better and learning how to kind of balance things in their life because it, it I think it's a problem. Why, why do you, like you, you work with lots of doctors um, and, and it seems as though, it seems quite common, most people I know, whether it's in Europe or over here, that like you say, all of these things like diabetes and, and heart disease and stress, they, they'll give you a, a, some sort of pharmaceutical tablet to, to deal with it. Right. What you're saying seems to make a lot more sense. And I only realized it myself when I started reading your book is, okay, well, stress seems to be a big problem in your life. It, it messes up all kinds of stuff in your system. Why, why, you know, why, don't, why aren't doctors aware of that? And why aren't they saying, well, look, you know, by the time you've got to this obesity and diabetes, it's probably too late. Why don't we try and sort of give you guidance on that earlier on to sort of prevent you coming to the inevitable <laughs> 50% of the population. I, you know, I think it's hard. Is I mean, it? I, I, I think um, doctors have so many people that are really sick coming into them. I remember I talked to a doc and he said, you know what? When I sit and I spend 20 minutes with a diabetic patient, I'll never forget this. It was a, I was a member of the American Academy of Family Practice. And uh, he said, I'll educate him for 20 minutes. And for the next two months, 29 days, 23 hours and 40 minutes until the next appointment, he's not thinking about me and I'm not thinking about him necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think it's us having to change our paradigm. Medicine is good. Mm -hmm. Make no doubt about it. I've, I've had personal experiences with family members where if it wasn't for modern medicine, I'd have lost family members. Mm -hmm. And so I am absolutely amazed at some of the modern technology and, the, and, and, and medicines that get made. However, where we failed is in prevention and lifestyle and teaching people how to try to uh, fend off becoming someone who's ill. And so it's, I, I think it's, um, it's the new emerging model, right? I, I mean, I, I'm teaching docs, my medical director and, and uh, partner in business, and we've written a lot together, Dr. Andrew Heyman. He started the integrative medicine program at University of Michigan um, developed the master's program in integrative medicine at George Washington School of Health Sciences, where if you're a doctor and you take that course, you can sit for the American Boards for Integrative Medicine. You know? um, it's the only uh, program of its kind in the U.S. Uh, 14 or 15 weeks of it is based on that book. Pretty proud and of that's that. that's what, four years old now? Oh, no, that book, <laughs> uh, yeah, that book's kind of old, but the new one's coming out uh, this year. And I mean, it's going to rock everybody because i mean it is the latest latest in science this has been used as kind of a, a standard I, mean, I wrote it thinking it was a book you know just for educated consumers and here a lot of doctors and nurses and pharmacists read that book because they're kind of at the same start point as a consumer they got taught how to deal with diseases and you know hey here's a surgery or this is how we diagnose an illness they never really got taught you know nutrition and kind of another perspective on how to look at how things can be utilized to help people feel well. Mm. So, you know, my work, um, even when I developed my cloud-based informatics program based on the metabolic code, where we feed in labs, we feed in a questionnaire, we feed in your biometrics, and it shows a report of where do you need to start working? Like, where is your weak spots? That whole, that whole algorithm was built on how far are you away from being well? Mm. Not do you have an illness. Doctors are great at diagnosing do you have an illness. They got that down. But we don't really do enough to say, for example, if you came into me and in the U.S. blood sugars are normally 65 to 99. If you came into me and had a 95 blood sugar, that would be a normal blood sugar, right? 65 to 99, 95 is normal. But the Kaiser Permanente study, 47,000 lives over a decade showed that for every point over 84, it represented a 6% risk of being a diabetic in the next decade. So if you had a 95 blood sugar, you have a 60% risk of being diabetic in the next decade. Hmm. So a lot of my time is spent on trends and hmm. looking at trend analysis. Where are you going? So if your blood sugar is trending high and your blood pressure is trending high and your kidney function is starting to go down, and you don't have enough electrolytes, and your lipids look bad, 
I better start working on that insulin resistance and that blood sugar and get you to diet better and get you to move better and get you to drop some weight. Because a lot of those things may clean up if I can convince you that this is where you're moving in your future right. instead of towards health. Yeah. So you mentioned quite a bit about inflammation and um, what, how, how is that connected then? And, and is, is that caused as a result of, of the, the cortisol or is, is, is there a number of things that affect that inflammation? Great question. So, I mean, inflammation, you can think of it as it's the response of your immune system. So your immune system is really in the center of your aging process, right? And so inflammation can be triggered by um, working out too hard, right? You can trigger inflammation and injury. You could get an infection. So you could get a bug that turns your immune system on and then all these inflammatory compounds start getting made. And so you hear of people with chronic infections mm -hmm. like Lyme, uh, disease, for example, or biotoxin exposure, like exposure to mold or something like that, your immune system can start to get revved up. So mm -hmm. for example, if you're a person with diabetes, the th there, there's some papers that, that sedate that, you know, you have the equivalent of a low grade infection going on in you all the time because of the way your immune system is behaving. Mm -hmm. So inflammation can be um, from a traumatic injury. So, hey, my knee swelled up, right? Or inflammation could be, I'm sending inflammatory compounds that are hitting the inside of my arteries and I'm getting endothelial dysfunction. I'm getting, my blood vessels are getting stiff. I'm developing plaque, right? So you're getting plaque on your arteries. It could be, uh, I don't eat fiber. I eat a very high fat diet. And so I start to kill off my friendly flora in my gut, right? The microbiome. And when those microbiomes break up, the, there's something called lipopolysaccharide, which is in the cell wall of that, that that lipopolysaccharide circulates, attaches to different organs, crosses the blood-brain barrier and activates the immune system in your brain and triggers an inflammatory cascade to start to occur. It starts to cause things like neuroinflammation. It can damage your heart tissue. It could damage your kidneys. And so it's really inflammation can be, it, it can be caused by a variety of things. And some people are more prone to trigger it. Right. You know? So some people are more genetically predisposed. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. They take care of themselves. May not ever turn those genes on. But if they do the wrong things, those genes get turned on, those switches. And now all of a sudden... Those inflammatory compounds are, you know, moving through your body and damaging tissues and organs. So, what, what, what does the body release? Those is it? Is it a way of healing? So, is it like sending blood there? To, is is there gen, the, the real purpose purpose to heal? But it's similar to the cortisol. It goes into sort of override if things are not great. That's exactly it. So, right. when you think of metaflammation, the model's simple. Your body's supposed to turn the inflammation off. Inflammation occurs to heal. Okay. And so you get an, so for example, when you say you train arms mm -hmm. and man, you're like, man, my biceps are sore. What happened to me, man? You know, the trainer really ripped up me today. And you release a lot of what's called interleukin-6. And that's IL-6 is an inflammatory cytokine, but it stimulates satellite cells in your muscle, which is going to mean your, helps your muscles to get bigger, which is why we're training uh, most of the time. And, uh, and so, and, but if I keep training and say I'm under stress and I never turn off that IL-6, that interleukin-6 from releasing, now all of a sudden that starts to trigger a chronic inflammatory response. So I'm not in a first trigger the inflammatory response, then trigger the anti-inflammatory and repair response. Now I'm reset to be able to train again. It's, oh, the inflammatory response stayed turned on. Mm. So yes, we need an inflammatory response. We do not need a chronic inflammatory state. Right. I've had that before. Like sometimes I've trained really hard and, and I've got sick. Um, like just picked up different things that are not necessarily related. And I suppose maybe that's what's going like probably a lot of stress. I've, I've, normally it happens when I'm traveling a lot and I'll have a big workout and then suddenly something will happen. So it's probably where you've got a lot of inflammation in you caused by training and stress and everything, which probably creates that disease. Is that what, what, what's probably happening? Oh, yeah. When you get under a lot of stress, your immune system gets inactive, and now all of a sudden you catch a cold easier, you catch a flu. 
Think of endurance athletes post-marathon. What are they prone towards? Upper respiratory infections, right? And so when people train really hard, um, pro athletes, you know, mid-season, they're getting colds and flus. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with as you train really hard and you don't get enough repair, maybe you're deficient in nutrients like vitamin D and zinc, mm -hmm. um, and you're low in those things and you get exposed to a cold bug and man, you're ripe to, to get it. And the other piece is, is when you start pushing out a lot of cortisol, you dump a lot of electrolytes. So you tend to lose your potassium and your magnesium quicker out of your body. Right, And so that means leg cramps, muscle spasms, legs feel tighter. I don't have the power in my muscle that I normally had. Where did the power go? I thought, you know, I, I felt great three weeks ago. Well, how is it that different? And I'll bet you could, you could say, because I talk to trainers about this all the time. I'll say to them, I'll bet when you put your hands on a bar, you already know whether you're going to make that lift or not. <laughs> Before you even pull it, you can tell or putting it on your back. You know, a lot of times, why am I doing this? Or I got this. And, and, and I think a lot of that is, um, we have that sixth sense about us of, do we have metabolic reserve or not? Mm. You know, do we have durability, strong metabolic reserve and resiliency? When I'm teaching, like I teach some of the um, special forces, uh, you know, professionals that work with their, their special forces. And, and when I'm teaching them, I'm always talking about durability, resiliency, and metabolic capacity. Because as people get pushed, the more you're training, you know, say you're a triathlete, uh, maybe you're going for a Tough Mudder, or you're going for a Sparta race, and you're pushing hard, um, how you rest determines that resiliency and capacity that you're going to have as you approach that race, right? Mm -hmm. you, I, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of Olympians. And, and I'll say, well, how many Olympians don't make it? You know, ones that trained for four years and then got a flu bug the week before or blew, you know, came up lame or got inflamed the month before. Just imagine if you worked for your degree for three years and 11 months <laughs> and you're on stage to get that, that diploma and somebody went, ah, no. That's kind of how I equate that for people that, you know, work that hard for so many years to compete. And I think it's unfortunate if we don't, if we don't understand it's more than biomechanics that create injury. Mm. Biomechanics intersect with biochemistry at all times. Right. Right? You can, you can create inflammation by your habits. You can train inappropriately, trigger inflammation, that then affects your biochemistry. So they're always intersecting. And you, you also mentioned that fat is an inflammation factory. What, what, what's, yeah. is, that, is that right? Have I got... <laughs> it is. You're right. You're, yeah, you, should, you should be over here. And I should be asking you questions. No, that's exactly right. So it turns out that you make adipokines, right? Fat and inflammatory compounds and other compounds that get released from your fat that do things like raise your blood pressure alter your immunity, cause your blood vessels to feel to be more stiff, uh, trigger things like uh, a, a lowering of adiponectin. And adiponectin is, is a compound your body makes to make your insulin receptors open up and work. Right. So when the adiponectin goes down and the insulin receptors close, now all of a sudden I got higher blood sugar, I need to release more insulin, and now I'm going to start storing that fat. So it's a vicious circle almost, isn't it? I Especially guess. Especially when you get that fat on. I mean, the, 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 you know, and I say this with a lot of, you know, compassion. My brother passed away a few years ago. At one point, he was 476 pounds. Yeah. Uh, and, and he was an athlete at one point in his life. Uh, and, and so it's very, uh, with a lot of compassion that I talk to people about, try to do your best to try to get your weight down. You don't have to get it all off. You don't have to worry about being perfect. Just try to get some of your weight off because the more that you could get off, the lower your risk goes. If you just lose 10% of your body weight, if you're overweight, just 10%, it reduces your all-cause mortality by 75%. <laughs> so when people come into me, I'm all about creating re realistic goals and us just working towards those goals if it's something like that because visceral fat, I mean, it does a few things. One, it releases all those those compounds in your body. 
Two, it stores chemical toxins from the environment. Mm. So we know yeah. now that the heavier you are, the more pollutants you actually carry are in your body. Mm. And so... Like a sponge, I guess. Of, uh, it's a storage vessel. Yeah. yeah. Just And so, you know, and I find it sometimes when people are losing weight, they may even feel that a little bit. Like, oh, I don't feel quite as, you know, why do I feel bad? I feel a little bit toxic. And sometimes hey, I'm not drinking enough water. Maybe they need to get into a steam or sauna, try to sweat some of that stuff out. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times what happens is, is people just think, oh, I'm just going to cut my calories. Just got to remember, when people do low-calorie dieting, they'll lose as much as 30% of their weight and muscle. Right. So it's how do I do things to... Because remember, muscle is the currency of aging, right? What do you mean by that? Well, the more muscle you can hold as you age, the better your metabolism will be, the more stable you will be as you're aging. As people get older and their uh, nervous system starts to you know, misfire a little bit, having stable steps is really important. <laughs> Especially when you get up to me, you know? like, like I said, I'm I'm thinking of those things in the future. Yeah. So the way I think of things now at 60 is, well, what do I want to be at 70? Do I want to be whether you know, am I worried about my bench press or am I worried about a stable gait and better stability, you know, as I'm aging? So mm -hmm. you you craft things around those kind of things as well. So what's your view on like COVID, the COVID? Obviously, there's you know a lot of people getting it on different levels. How much is this? playing into it, the, you know, being overweight or probably having too much around, around the belly, having too high a cortisol. Do, do you think that if, if you're healthy, um, well, I, I know it's obvious, but what, what's, you know, what, what, what's your thoughts on COVID as it relates to kind of what's going on in the, you know, to, to the average American at the moment? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I've been interviewed a lot on it. And uh, first of all, I think it's tragic and I really feel bad for family members that have lost family uh, due to COVID. Um, I think it was a wake-up call uh, because we did start to correlate these issues of um, people that had previous or pre-existing conditions were more prone and, and more fragile as it relates to COVID. And they were all conditions where inflammation in the immune system uh, are a part of it. So people that are diabetic, people that were hypertensive, people that had autoimmune disorders or pulmonary disorders, um, all those types of things made you more predisposed because your body's already in an inflammatory state. And then, of course, when you hear about what COVID does, it creates a cytokine storm. It activates your immune system to even create more inflammatory compounds. Really? And that's what causes the damage in your tissues. And, and so for I think for, for people, I know a lot of people, at least, that's, that really decided, hey, I'm going to start to change the way I live try to take on being healthier. The other thing I, that I thought was Im impressive about COVID was some of the information coming out about um, vitamins like vitamin D, where if you had a better vitamin D level, you had a much better chance of not needing to be put on a ventilator versus mm. if you had a poor vitamin D level. And that vitamin D helped in terms of, you know, kind of your outcome. I think that started to come back to, wow, well, maybe these things called essential nutrients actually are essential and yes we need drug therapy but maybe at baseline we should be talking to people about adequacy of their nutrition because let's face it for a lot of people they don't they don't eat healthy as they could mm. and uh, I'm not once again not people make their own choices mm -hmm. you know so I'm, I'm not one to be critical um, but I know that it's important you know, now in hindsight, I think a lot of people wished they would have had a warning to prepare themselves, right? That then maybe they could have taken care of themselves a little better or that family member a little better, uh, whether it's taking vitamin D or taking zinc or getting a little bit, of, getting some walks in or trying to, you know, be a little healthier. Because I think that makes a huge difference uh, in the outcome. Uh, and, and look, uh, I think it's unprecedented. I mean, in my, all my years of being in healthcare, never seen anything like this. Uh, and I, I, I think it makes it ever more important for people to understand the value of taking care of themselves, understanding their metabolic code, right? Mm -hmm. Where are their metabolic breaks at? What do you need to focus on in order to feel well and get that vitality you deserve? So yeah, COVID, uh, I think it changed and shaped a lot of people's thinking. Mm. And do you think in general, and I know there's obviously exceptions, and, but in general, what you've said, the stress, the diet, the exercise, 
um, <clears throat> pretty much what we've been talking about for the last half hour. So, you, you know, that that is a big contributing factor to how bad you, you, you're affected by it in general, you think, based on what I, we know I, now. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for sure we could say that the, if you're um, inactive and not getting enough sleep and you've gained a lot of weight because your diet choices are poor and you're not exercising, uh, that, yeah, you put yourself more in a position to have a more adverse event. And, of course, there's healthy people that have suffered as well, right? Mm-hmm. So we're not going to – my son, 21-year-old athlete, he, he, you know, got the COVID uh, exposure and he felt pretty bad mm-hmm. and he had to be treated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, I don't want to leave the message that only if you're unhealthy, you could get this. Right. But I think that in general, uh, people that were, you know, overweight with diabetes, with heart disease, it's because their, their body wasn't as resilient. And I go back to that term, resilient. They didn't have the metabolic reserve to fight something off. They were predisposed. I always tell the story to people, you know, if you're a mile away from the Grand Canyon and you take one step forward, it's not that big a deal. But if you're on the edge of the Grand Canyon and you take that same one step, it's just one step. It's a lot bigger deal. Mm. I try to get people to get as far away from the edge as they can in relationship to their to their health chemistry, and I think that's what happened. Seventy eight percent of the U.S. population is overweight. Forty two percent of the U.S. population is obese. I already mentioned the fifty percent diabetes and pre diabetes population. We have a lot of people here. Um, we just haven't been taught. Mm. I, I you know I'm not putting blame on anybody no. or saying you're weak or nothing like that. It's we haven't systematically grasped. Um, being fit and well. You, uh, I think, coming from, from London, well, at least when I was in Europe, I saw smaller plates in general, uh, and people had to walk more <laughs> to get everywhere. And so that means, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, oh, you know the long-lived people, the centurions, like the Sardinians, right, in Sardinia, well, yeah, we talk about the you know what kind of food they eat, and they but uh, they also walk about four to six hundred steps up and down <laughs> hills all day long. They they take an hour for lunch. They don't work twelve hour days. No. Uh, they don't work six days a week. There's a lot to be said for that. I remember when, when I was in France and uh, I was consulting with a French company, and you know we got into work at eight a.m. and we sat and chatted till nine a.m. Then we had a break at 10 a.m. We worked from 9 to 10. And then, we, and then we had a break. Then we had an hour and a half lunch. And then we finished work at 4 p.m. and went home and rested so that we could go out to dinner at 7 p.m. And then, of course, they have six weeks off a year and a 36-hour work week. And people go, oh, it's the wine. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you know, look, I'm not telling you I'm not guilty of it. I mean, I, I work a lot. Um, mm. I try to make sure I shut down. I try to do breathing exercise. I make sure I get my workouts in. But I think it's part of us culturally that's put us at risk as well, even mm. though I know globally a lot of different cultures have suffered. I, I think we have to try to adopt a little different way of thinking about our health. Mm. And what, what are, in terms of diet, are, are there any basics? Like I know there's a ton of stuff out there, but <laughs> you know, fats, protein, carbs. Sure. Uh, you know, fasting, are there, are there any sort of basics, uh, even for people that, you know, don't know a lot, are not yet read the book? Is there some sort of key things that, you know, you should definitely consider following? I know sugar's a big one for you. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not, look, I'm not anti-sugar. If I'm at a birthday party and it's, if it's my birthday, I'm going to have a piece of birthday cake and I'm not going to feel too bad about it. Yeah. You know, I, so I don't take it to that extreme, but I think in general, people have way too much sugar in their diet each day and it's hidden sugars. They go and buy a green drink that they think is green and actually it's 88 grams of sugar. It's loaded with fruit juice. You know, that's not a green drink. That's a fruit drink. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of bread, a lot of pasta, a lot of cereal, a lot of rice, and, uh, and then add alcohol on top of it. And uh, we, get it, we get a lot of calories that are calorie dense, but not nutrient dense. So my baseline diet, and then fasting, uh, I, I think that um, time-restricted eating makes sense. When I was a little boy, I ate breakfast at 7, had lunch at noon, ate dinner at 5, and mm-hmm. I, was, I was a good little boy. Mm-hmm. I got a little snack at 7. So I basically ate 7 to 7. Yeah. 
oh, that's time-restricted eating, 12-12, <laughs> you know? And I think that uh, some of the 16-8 folks that are doing 16-8 every day, I think that can get them into trouble. I've seen people come in and their lipids are off and they start mm. to feel tired over a period of time. So I think that doing it two days a week or using something like uh, the Fast Bar from, uh, from uh, El Nutra, they've got a bar that you can eat in the morning and it, it mimics you fasting so you can get a little bit of nourishment in you. I think that has value. Obviously, the whole concept around fasting or at least time restriction is to trigger autophagy. And autophagy is eating up the waste proteins of your metabolism. So you get rid of your waste. You're carrying the garbage out. Right. If you keep eating all day long and all night long, you never carry the garbage out. The garbage keeps yeah. mounting up. So that, I think, is important. So what do you, in order to clean that up then, what are you saying? Like how, how many hours is ideal if you can have, is it, you're saying 12 hours, 12 to 14 hours? 12, 12 to 14 hours most days. We'll do 16, 8 a couple of days a week on people. We're real big on using fasting mimic diet. So, I mean, I've sat on their advisory board. That was uh, USC Keck Centers, uh, which is the longevity center that does research. They developed a kit that, you know, they do for five days and it mimics fasting and triggers, you know, really some really nice benefits to your metabolism. So I'm big on encouraging people to do that periodically, not all the time. And, and then our base diet is what I would call a modified, low-carb, anti-inflammatory, low-allergen diet. That's my baseline. And that baseline is teaching people to eat a lot of vegetables, I tell people three or four vegetables for every fruit. Hmm. That's kind of the rule I give them. And then I want the fruits to be low glycemic, less sugary fruit. And then legumes are okay. I mean, I know you've got, you've got uh, the paleo side. Oh, my God, you can't have legumes, but you can eat all the honey you want. <laughs> right? And then, and then there's the ketogenic side where only fat, a little bit of protein. Uh, and I've just found over the years of working with people that they need plant food. They need to eat plants. Do I believe that people should be uh, eating vegetarian? I'm not saying that. I think it's very difficult for a lot of people. The higher that you, more you perform, more you train. I know there's a couple of nice, you know, infomercials out on, on uh, plant-based eating for athletes. That's all good. But I think generally people do good if they can get a little bit of a animal protein. I like mm -hmm. it grass-fed. I like it wild-caught. I think they should eat more fish. Um, and... And so it usually starts out somewhere around 25% carb and then a mix of protein and fat based on how well the person does with protein and fat. We test for food uh, sensitivities and allergens because I really believe that's an issue. And I like to look at whether they're genetically able to handle saturated fat or not. Hmm. Because people that are doing ketogenic diets and they haven't checked their APOE 3-4 gene SNPs or 4-4 gene SNPs, you might look beautiful on the outside but you're all inflamed on the inside, right? So it's, it's really matching up what are the health practices that I need to do with the food I need to eat. I, I think, you know, we've even designed uh, a low carb vegan for people that, you know, religiously need to be right. vegan, but many times they're overweight and pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've done that. So we're, we're pretty open, but I'd say it's, you know, our, our favorite is kind of an anti-inflammatory stance on food. Uh, lower carb, especially for Americans who are, you know, a bunch of people with insulin resistance, but getting a lot of nutrient density out of their food. Mm, yeah. And then just having a bit of a gap between your meals so you're not constantly filling it with junk, filling your body with junk. So uh, of a couple course. more, just, just wrapping it up then. Of Supplements. Um, you mentioned vitamin D. Um, are there any sort of essential good things to think about and things that, you know, to sort of definitely stay away from or any, you know, any sort of dummies guide on, on supplementation? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I would have to say that, you know, I mean, I've spent my life writing about the value of dietary supplements, so I'm going to be skewed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, I definitely got an opinion. Uh, but I, I also have seen that uh, supplements help so many people. But there are warnings uh, like, where is it made from? What's the quality of the product? There's a lot of different products out in the market where it's kind of window dressing. You know, mm. they have one of everything that you've read about on the on the uh, on the social media pages, and you're like, oh wow, that's got to be good. It's got one of everything. Yeah, and they got three spritzes and a couple sprinkles of each ingredient, right? Yeah. Not enough of anything to really make a difference. There's some essential things people should consider. Uh, for example, uh, the NIH did a big study and showed that magnesium status 
is incredibly important to reduce your risk of becoming diabetic, pre-diabetic, uh, or have metabolic syndrome. And, and what they found is anywhere between 70 and 90% of Americans just don't get enough magnesium. Well, why not? Well, magnesium is in chlorophyll. So when you think of the blood of a plant is chlorophyll, mm-hmm. the center of the chlorophyll molecule is magnesium. Just like if you eat meat to get iron, the center of that hemoglobin is iron. Well, if I'm not eating greens, where am I getting my magnesium? Maybe, maybe some nuts. I think you breathe it in, right? <laughs> um, people say, oh, I can get it from an Epsom salt bath. Kind of, but your body has these, this whole digestive tract, it's called, that when you eat food, it breaks it down and takes the nutrients from it and then distributes it to everything, everywhere in your body, mm-hmm. Right. So getting magnesium in is important. So I regularly recommend magnesium to people. Uh, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, And of course, the essential nutrients. If you're not eating a really good diet, think about taking a multi. Uh, Zinc is really important today. Vitamin C, your body doesn't make itself. You got to keep getting that vitamin C in. Uh, And and then, of course, you know, are you eating sardines? Are you eating anchovies? Do you eat fish? If you don't get any fish in of any kind, like, oh, I don't do fish. You know, people say, I don't do fish. Well, then you're not getting omega-3 fatty acids in. So taking a fish oil supplement or something to help that is important. You know, probiotics and fiber, I think, are pretty important in mm-hmm. the space. Probably one of the most important nutrients that has study, like, I mean, unbelievable studies, 850 publications on it, is aged garlic extract. So aged garlic, which is a Japanese compound that's now they're used in America, number one selling garlic in health food stores. But it has studies in humans, multiple studies, 850, that shows it helps with blood pressure. It reduces inflammatory signaling. Mm. It helps to regress vulnerable plaque. It helps to restore your endothelial function. It has, it has a lot of multiple benefits that's been shown in human trials. So if I was thinking of like, hey, I'm going to take an avant-garde product, something a little bit outside of vitamin A and D and E and a multivitamin and some minerals. I want to add something in that's appropriate for the 21st century here in the U.S. where everybody's hypertensive and pre-diabetic and their arteries are plaquing. I like aged garlic a whole lot. It's called mm-hmm. kaiolic. So that's a, a, a great ingredient. Right. Um, and then, of course, there's the things to manage stress and adaptogens. Adaptogens. Yeah. So what are they? You get the the adaptogens that are really big. So once again, if you're training hard, I'm a big fan of adaptogens because it'll help you to stay resilient in your training and you'll and it'll help you to repair from your training uh, because it keeps your brain sending out signals in a balanced way about the stress you just put yourself under. Mm -hmm. So uh, rhodiola is a big one. I mentioned that Uh, ginseng is a big one. Uh, You know, Siberian ginseng is a big one. Shazandra. There's one that's really big on the endurance athlete side called cordyceps. Uh, right. cordyceps. What are they mushrooms are they? Is yeah, it? cordyceps right. is Chinese caterpillar fungus, right? right? That's that's actually what it comes from, and uh, and but it helps you with what keeping your oxygen on your your hemoglobin longer, so your endurance and stamina improves. Mm. If you're nervous and anxious, and you perseverate, and you're a list maker, and you, everything's got to be just so. <laughs> In order for you to get through your evening, you're going to go to bed and that list is complete. I don't know if you know anybody like I know, that. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering. <laughs> I'm wondering right now. I'm just thinking you know somebody <laughs> that's like that. And uh, <laughs> uh, the theanine is really good for that because it helps to take the edge off that, right. the compulsive side of that. And theanine, then if you're somebody that's it craving, cool. you're craving carbs. Man, I got I to gotta have them carbs at the end of the workday because, I, man, I had a hard day. Relora, R-E-L-O-R-A, actually has claims around stress-induced weight gain. So to get an FTC claim on a product is pretty tough. So they've got human studies that showed that when you took it, that you didn't crave food as much. So you didn't gain weight because you weren't eating through a, you know, a, a pint of haagen Doss and finishing it up with some cookies and then looking for the <laughs> tortilla chips, which is what a lot of folks end up doing in the evening. It's mm. striking how much that happens. Yeah. So before final question, if people want to find out more about you, where, where can you, your books, your, your teachings, where, where can they go? 
Well, I'm a hermit. You can see I'm dug in here in the corner, and I don't have a website. You, you know, right. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, but I, I, for I my thought you've got, you've got a website. I've got jimlaval.com. Yes. Okay. So right. if people want to learn about me, they can go to jimlaval.com. If they want to learn about the metabolic code, they could go to metaboliccode.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the two ways that uh, they can find out more about me. And of course, apparently I'm all over the internet. I didn't, I didn't really realize that. People post all the stuff at the lectures that okay. I do. And I'm not that savvy at it, you know, so they're like, oh, wow, that's on there. Really cool. <laughs> do you uh, do any of the social media things? I haven't. I, I, I'm going to. Right. So I've got the real Jim Laval on Instagram and hashtag Jim Laval, I think. Right. I, I've, got, I've got those, uh, all, all those uh, tags that I'm supposed to yeah. have. I haven't been doing it much to date, but I'm starting to now because I'm moving more into Wanting to help educate consumers yeah. more. I've done a lot of work in the professional space. I, I just find out that, you know, we need to create a new language of health mm -hmm. where we're talking to people about how far they're away from being well and how to get there, how to, how to have performance health. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, I think it's time for me to kind of get out there and hopefully communicate uh, to a new uh, group of folks. Yeah. Well, certainly something that I think a lot of people need to hear. And I think it would do, I, I did check out your Facebook page and I, I, I know you don't do too much on there. But it's, <laughs> <You're>, it's, <laughs> that's exactly right. I'm honest, right? I mean, I got to tell you, it's like, uh, I'm not there yet. No, but it's a good, with your book, I think it's a good thing for you to, uh, yeah, good thing to check out. No, we're getting, we're good. getting moving on it now. Yeah. yeah. I've got a whole strategy behind it and a team. I mean, it's all that stuff yeah. now, but, uh, you know, late bloomer. What can I say? Exactly. It's, it's never too late. So final question. And, I'm, and I, I was going to ask you this earlier on, but we kind of got into the meat of the conversation. But the, the, the final question I always ask is, escape your limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. I wonder if you could kind of tie that into the story about why you decided to go on this path that you did. Well, um, and maybe we could kind of combine those together a bit. <laughs> you know what? That, that's a fantastic question because, you know, when I, um, I was competing and I was going through pharmacy school, I lost my scholarship because I, I had a neck injury, so I couldn't go on to play football in college. So I went from being this all-star athlete to collapsing a disc, losing the scholarship. So I, I, you know, I got pretty down, right? And I found bodybuilding and found powerlifting and, and really trained hard, qualified for the U.S. Nationals. But I still wasn't feeling well. I wasn't healthy. Uh, I went to someone that uh, put me on that path. And I want to tell this story because I think it, it sums up exactly what you said about escaping your limits. So here I was, like, working on my health. I was behind the counter of a pharmacy in the roughest neighborhood in Cincinnati. Because back then I was 265 pounds, one big knot, you know, just qualified for the USA, the North Coast USA. And they said, we'll put Laval in the toughest neighborhoods. Nobody's going to rob him, right? And uh, so one night a lady came up to me. She handed me a, 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 a prescription for a diabetes med. And she went off to do her shopping. We were in a farm, a Kroger, Kroger store. So it was, it was a pharmacy and a grocery store. She comes back. And I looked in her grocery cart. Every food she picked was going to make her diabetes worse. And I did what I wasn't supposed to do. It was like five till nine. And we're putting the boards up to the windows anyway. I said, hey, can I take you around and show you a couple things? Can I just give you a couple of suggestions? Because all I could think about was my grandma. My grandma was beautiful, but, you know, you know, blind, you know, amputated fingers. I mean, it really made an impression on me. Mm. And uh, I took her around. And this is in the roughest neighborhood, lowest income neighborhood. The next two weeks other people were showing up for the grocery store with from the, from the nice pharmacy uh, pharmacist. Right. And, and so I thought, wow, if people of every income are interested in their health, why can't we educate more people? Went to the Kroger's, uh, 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 Kro actually I went to their president and I said, I want to tag foods in every Kroger store to show diabetic friendly and heart health friendly foods. And I want to write a book with the Jewish hospital cholesterol center, healthy shopping at Kroger's. And he looked at me and he said, you got to remember, this is the 1980s, right? He said, son, are you crazy? I'm not about to tell people what, what to eat or how to eat. He goes, oh, grocery store. I, 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 we sell everything. <laughs> Long story short, I go to my marketing director, uh, my pharmacist marketing director. I said, I want to do events. I want to tag foods. I want to test cholesterol and blood sugars at a pharmacy and the grocery store. And I want to make a wow event out of it. And uh, we found more diabetics. We did more 
you know, finding of hyperlipids in people. We taught people about eating well, and we actually developed the first FDA-approved food tagging system that went into Kroger's and impacted 2.7 million lives a week. Wow. So here's the deal. Here's the deal, right? This is my close because you asked you ask my you asked my story. Why do I do what I do? It it's kind of when I thought about it, all you got to do is reach out and touch one person. So I touched a person that was on a Medicaid card in the most indigent part of the area late at night, and it developed into a program that ushered in millions of impressions of information about people's health. So if we can just think about helping one person, mm. it can change millions of lives. And so that's what I think is unachievable. We always think it's unachievable to get to millions of lives, but we affected 250,000 people at Lifetime Fitness with our programs, 93% compliance. So I think we better escape our limits and we should reach for the stars and try to help and serve as many people as we can. Mm. Fantastic. Well, what a great way to end. Um, we definitely have to do a part two because I've not got through half of my questions. But um... I'm all in, man. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm wordy. I can't help it. I can't help it. It's the Italian in me. Did you notice those fingers going? <laughs> it's like... Jim, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Was it was great. Thanks for having me, by the way. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.